That was beautiful, wasn't it? Just, uh, I don't know if you noticed the note in your bulletin on that, but uh, that arrangement, that particular arrangement that Tristan and Will played was uh, done by J.D. Bledsoe. And he used to play it with his wife, Margaret Jo. Here, there's J.D., I see him here today. And uh, Tristan and Will chose that and played that today to honor the music ministry of their family through the years here. And uh, that's a really neat thing for you guys to do. And we appreciate you guys and, and all you've meant. Uh, JD actually wrote that music out by hand, but it's so perfectly done. If I were to show it to you from here, you would swear it had been printed out. So uh, just, just meticulous and perfect in how he did it. So thank you for that, doing that for us. Uh, today is, of course, the concert, and there will be more of that kind of behavior at 6 o'clock. Beautiful music played on competing pianos, all simultaneous. Uh, but you'll want to want to be a part of that. There's, there's even going to be a probably one-time only event, and that is that the bell choir, you might have heard, is going to be here as well from Forest Lake Academy to play some songs. But because it's early in the year, they have especially asked a certain Gable Patterson to return one more time and play his bells on the end of the row next to his brother Nathan, who will be standing next to his brother Aaron, who will be playing bells as well. So, and we're going to figure out a way for Ariel to walk in front of them in the middle of the song. So, we're working on that part. But, so that is going to be a big exciting time for us. And uh, I hope you'll be here to see this and be a part of it. Uh, what else? Oh, yeah, I just, just got word from Pastor Delwyn. He was off today with the group. There's about 25 folks from our church that are participating today with the Lighthouse Christian Fellowship, uh, an Adventist group in the area. Uh, that, as you'll recall, we were bringing school supplies for backpacks, and Florida Hospital had contributed a whole lot of backpacks. I think there was as many as 300 backpacks fully filled with supplies uh, that were given away today. Half my family was at that event today. Alicia and Ariel and Gable went there, uh, and the other half are here today. But that's gone really well, Pastor Delwyn said, and uh, about 25 folks from our church participating. So it's neat to be involved in, uh, in an event like that in our community. And I know a lot of young people are going to start school this week with everything they need, thanks to the goodness of folks here and, and at the hospital. So wonderful things. All right, and of course, call to worship. Was that wonderful or what? Yeah, that was terrific. All right, love to see the families together. All right, let's pray. Father in heaven, we pray uh, for your spirit today, not so much to help us understand because the lesson is pretty simple, but to help us live by the word of the lesson. Lord, we pray for that this day in Jesus' name, amen. So it was a tough week for former executive director of the Family Research Council, Josh Dugar, and former Subway spokesman, Jared Fogel. There's nothing for us to gain in me giving you details. Suffice it to say, both of these, both of these gentlemen that what they were doing when they thought no one was looking has come back and destroyed their lives. You know the story. And in truth, a double life is already a destroyed life, even if you haven't gotten caught yet. I hope, I hope I'm not talking to anyone today caught in a double life. For Fogel, it looks like jail. And for Subway, one of the fastest Who's Jared Fogel disappearing acts in advertising history. How do you take someone who's been your face and make them disappear? For Dugar, probably the loss of everything in his life that actually mattered. And for his extended family, more fodder for the critics who always said they were crazy. I mean, who has 19 kids, right? The irony here 
It's not the specific sins of a family like the Dugars or Josh Dugar that do them in in this culture. You see, you're not destroyed in this culture because you allow lust to drive your actions. Just ask the Kardashians. They've made millions off of allowing lust to drive their actions. Rather, it is because... He publicly claimed to be against such sins and then was revealed as a hypocrite. That is why a lust-crazed world laughs someone like this to scorn. I suppose it's the price of fame and folly. It's the price of being a hypocrite. It reminds me of the words of Paul, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 Beginning in verse 11, make it your ambition to lead a quiet life. You should mind your own business and work with your hands just as we told you so that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders and so that you will not be dependent on anybody. Faithful in the little things. I wonder if... Josh Dugar wishes he'd been as quick to embrace this kind of counsel from the Bible as he claimed to have been to promote other counsel. But this isn't one of those ain't it awful sermons. Instead, it's rather more like isn't it all so very sad? What a waste. And what misery... A man or a woman living a double life causes for themselves and for everyone around them. I hope I'm not talking directly right now to anyone in this room. I hope there isn't anyone here living a double life. But if you are, I have a message for you, a message that both Jared Fogel and Josh Duger found out to be all too true. And what is that message? The end is certain. Be sure, one day, your sin will find you out. Yet I don't actually want to spend the whole day dwelling on negative stories. There's plenty of those for sure. I just took two from the last week. Rather today I want to paint a picture of what could be. Who you could be if you could ever come to know who you are in Jesus. This is the second week of our fall series entitled The End is Certain. We're spending our time in the book of Daniel. And in the book of Daniel, we read these words. Chapter 1, verse 1. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the articles from the temple of God. These he carried off to the temple of his God in Babylonia and put in the treasure house of his God. Now along with the treasures from the temple, Nebuchadnezzar also took the greatest treasures of the land, its very best people, and carried them away into exile. We set up this context of Daniel's life and reality last Sabbath the story of how Daniel ended up in Babylon in the first place. And we talked a little bit about how Daniel's younger years in Jerusalem were not easy years. It was a hard time from when Josiah was, was brought back, killed in battle with the Egyptians, to the domination by the Egyptians, to later domination by the Babylonians, and then finally Nebuchadnezzar comes with his army. And we read in the book of Jeremiah, we discover Daniel was surrounded by a lot of godless and wicked people. He could be forgiven if as he was being walked all the way to Babylon, to exile, he could be forgiven for believing he had been forsaken by God. Have you ever been in a situation like that? where everything you hoped for went wrong and you're pretty sure God can't be with me anymore 
and nobody around cares? It's clear God doesn't care. And here you are going to a foreign land where you're going to have to try to survive in the midst of foreign people. Wouldn't it be likely in a situation like that that your mind would start to think, you know, I've got to figure out how to survive somehow. And I'll bet the best way to survive here is just kind of try to fit in. Just kind of let all that other stuff go and just kind of try to see how they do it and, and fit in. That might seem like something we would do, but the story of Daniel is not the too often repeated story of a selfish hypocrite who says one thing and does another. Nor is his the story of a weak-willed pleasure seeker who drowned his exile woes in wine and women in song. And it isn't even the story of a power-hungry social climber who sacrificed all principles in the name of power and riches. Uh, make no mistake, Daniel will gain power and likely gained riches, but not because those were the things he went after. And he will be tested regarding his fidelity to his profession, but with each test, Daniel will prove faithful. Ironically, if Daniel had wanted to embrace a life of lust and self-gratifying, no one would have cared because there wasn't anybody around anymore. Unlike Fogel and Dugar, he actually had nothing to lose. But unlike Fogel and Dugar, Daniel knew who he was. He was a servant of the Lord God of Israel. And as such, nothing would turn him from both professing and acting in accordance with what he knew to be true about his God and about himself. The tone for the reality of the life of Daniel is set in chapter 1 of the book, and we're going to spend the balance of our time there today. Daniel could stand for what he believed because he knew who he was and he knew who God was. Can the same be said for us? Daniel chapter 1, verse 1. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the articles from the temple of God. These he carried off to the temple of his God in Babylonia and put in the treasure house of his God. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, chief of his court officials, to bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility. Young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach them the language and literature of the Babylonians. The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They were to be trained for three years, and after that they were, enter, they were to enter the king's service. Among those who were chosen were some from Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. The chief official gave them new names, to Daniel the name Belteshazzar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. All right. So you got taken off to this land, but suddenly good fortune has found you. You have been gathered together now in a group who get to receive special training. What an amazing opportunity for a fortunate few. So what are you willing to give up in order to succeed in your new opportunity. I mean, we don't want to be stupid here, right? If what we were doing in Jerusalem was so good, why did our city fall? Maybe they know a thing or two. Maybe we ought to learn a little bit. 
about how they do things. And, and besides that, if we stand up for all those quaint traditions, you know, the one that sticks his head up, that's the one who gets his head cut off, right? Let's just try to fit in. Let's just try to make this work. What will you give up for a chance like this? Well, if you're Daniel, not much at all. Verse 8, but Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine, and he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself this way. So what's the issue here? We've often come at this from a few different angles, and, I, and there's validity in all of them. One of the ones is we've, we've come at it from the temperance angle. You can't think your best if you're eating the richest foods and you're drinking the wine of the king, and there's, there's no way you could prosper in that route. So, so Daniel said no because it would be intemperate. Well, that's true. But is it enough? There's the kosher angle. Daniel was raised as, as a true Israelite, and, and because of that, there were certain rules that God had given as to what could be eaten and what couldn't be eaten, and, and there was probably shellfish on that table and probably, probably pork on that table. Okay, true. But you know, you can pick and choose, right? You could still go to the table and take a little bit of this and a little bit of that and just leave those other things. You know, you do it at potlucks, right? You understand that. Both of those are legitimate. And I believe both of those are factors. However, I believe the biggest reason that Daniel takes this stand is really not found in those two explanations, but rather in that, in those days, when food was prepared, and particularly when meat foods were prepared, the animals weren't just killed, they were sacrificed to the gods. And Daniel's problem is he refuses to do anything that would give glory to any god except the God of Israel. When you know who you are and whose you are, you can stand up to anything. I had, I had kind of a Daniel-like moment in my life once. It was just once. But it's still pretty neat, and I've probably kind of told you this story before, but, but I'll just reference it again. It happened back before I was a pastor when I was a chemical engineer, and I was, I was working in a plant uh, in Tampa, and when I first came to work there, they told me that they wanted me to be a, what they called a shift supervisor, which, which implies you're going to work a rotating schedule. And so I told them before I came, when I was interviewing and all that, I said, okay, but, but I, can't, I can't work on Friday night or, or on Sabbath. I can't do that. And that would seem a little strange, but, but they said, well, I, I think we can make that work out. And, and, and so they went ahead and hired me, and I spent, I spent about six months training and, and learning different things. And the, the time finally came for them to put me on shifts. And so I went to them, and I said, okay, you remember when you hired me that you said I wouldn't have to work on Friday nights or Saturdays. Well, you know, they didn't really remember that, it turns out. And I guess maybe they thought after I got into the swing of things, we'd just kind of, you know, keep your head down, right? Just do the work. But I said, no, I, I don't think I can do that. I'm not going to do that. And, and, and the result of this was I got the only audience I ever got with the plant manager. It was a big plant and a lot of people worked there and you just didn't even see the plant manager. He, he was always up in the office and we were always out there in the plant. But anyway, I got my one chance to meet with him. He was, he was a very secular Dutch person. And I think he thought when I came into his office that I'd just kind of be overwhelmed by it all and I would let this stupid idea go. And, and so I did. I walked very timidly into his office and, 
And he basically said, what are you, stupid? And I said, well, maybe, but uh, I'm not going to do that. And it was kind of funny because up until that moment, he had all this power in this discussion. But then at the moment I said, no, I'm not going to do that. Then it was him who was kind of stammering for a little while. And he finally dismissed me and I went on my way. And, and miraculously, they made arrangements that I was able to work and not have to work on Sabbath. Now, I wish I could tell you that I was always a great Daniel type in that way. But the truth is, the next place I worked for a far less demand, I didn't stick to my principles. And Daniel 1 verse 9. Now God had caused the official to show favor and compassion to Daniel. But the official told Daniel, I'm afraid of my lord the king who has assigned your food and drink. Why should he see you looking worse than the other young men your age? The king would then have my head because of you. Daniel then said to the guard whom the chief official had appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, please test your servants for ten days. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then compare our appearance with that of the young men who eat the royal food and treat your servants in accordance with what you see. So he agreed to this and tested them for 10 days. Now, I want to point something out here. The official is testing them, but in truth, Daniel and his friends are testing the Lord. And what I want to tell you is this. There are right ways to put the Lord to the test. And there are wrong ways to put the Lord to the test. Grumbling and complaining and saying, Lord, why is it always harder for me? Why did you send us out into this wilderness to die of thirst? That's the wrong way to test the Lord. In fact, the Bible says, like your faithless forefathers who put the Lord to the test at the waters of Massah and Meribah, the story of Israel in the wilderness, testing the Lord's patience. Don't test that. And then there is also the wrong test that is the self-glorifying presumptive test. This is what the devil tried to get Jesus to do during the temptations when he put him up on the temple and said, throw yourself down. But Jesus said, it is written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. So not faithless grumbling tests or, or self-glorifying presumption tests. Don't test the Lord that way. But the test of the Lord that comes from confident action in the Lord's name is God's chance to reveal to others his glory through your life. And this is what Daniel and his friends did here. Give us 10 days. 10 days, okay, it can make a bit of a difference in your health, but is it going to make a huge noticeable difference? Well, it will if the Lord's blessing is on it. And so they said, Lord, if you want us to remain faithful, then honor what we're doing and make it obvious that you are with us. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego will get an even more intense opportunity to have their faith in the Lord tested. Verse 15, at the end of the 10 days, they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. So the guard took away their choice food and the wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables instead. A short time with the blessing of the Lord can make a huge difference. So let me ask you this at this point. What could you commit yourself to for 10 days, giving God the chance to, in a short time, make a huge difference in your life? Diet, I mean, that's the story we're talking about here. If you were to drop the junk and eat well for 10 days, asking the Lord's blessing, that could change your life. Your marriage, 10 days where you quit fighting for your rights and your way 
asking for the Lord's blessing and instead show love and compassion, that could change the rest of your life. Ten days of devotion to God where you make a point every day to get up and say, Lord, I'm giving you this time. Bless me. Ten days of reading in the Gospels could change the rest of your life. Generosity. Here's a crazy idea. Donate what you would earn in two weeks worth of work, that's 10 days, right? To some charitable cause and spend every minute you're working those weeks thinking about how what you're doing will go to bless someone else. That could change how you view work, couldn't it? That could change your life. What might God do with the rest of your life if you test him for 10 days somehow? Here's what God gave Daniel and his friends after the 10 days. To these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning. And Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. At the end of the time set by the king to bring them into his service, the chief official presented them to Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them, and he found none equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, so they entered the king's service. In every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them, he found them ten times. Ten days, ten times. How neat is that? He found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters in his whole kingdom. And Daniel remained there until the first year of King Cyrus. Now, not every follower of God is assigned the same path in life. You know that, right? Daniel had his assignment. Jeremiah had his assignment. Ezekiel had his assignment. We all have our assignment. Not all of us are called to the same path, yet we are each called to glorify God in our own special way. But living out our days in faithfulness and in the favor of the Lord, that's an opportunity we all get. And when we are faithful, God allows and enables sometimes even the fruits of our sorrows to become the blessings of others. I had a most interesting thing happen this last week. Wednesday, someone came by my office. She came in and sat down and we started to talk and she said, Pastor, I've I've been going through a really hard time. About a year ago, the place where I was working closed down and I lost my job. And I've been struggling for about a year to try to find another job and I've, I've completely come to the end of my resources. I had to give up my apartment several weeks ago. I've been staying with someone, but I can't do that any longer beyond this weekend. Now, there is something for me. I have a friend who has invited me to come to the town where they live and stay with her, but I don't even have enough money to get there. Is there anybody that can help? And I said, well, let me see what I can do. I'll call you back later today or, or maybe tomorrow morning. Maybe, maybe there's something that can work out. So, so I made a point and I, I was going to talk with Pastor Roger because when it comes to members and issues like that, he's, he's involved in that process as our church administrator. And, and so I, I had heard him talking in his office. You know, our offices are right next to each other. So I got up to go into his office and he wasn't there. So I I went back and got busy doing other things and I heard him again working in there and I had a minute so I got up and I went and he was gone again. It's elusive for being such a big fella but I, I couldn't find him. And so I thought, well, I'll just go talk to Joyce, because she's always involved too. She handles these kinds of things. And I walk down the hall and not even Joyce is there. Well, by now, it's time to start picking up kids and all those things. And I thought, well, I'll just have to deal with this tomorrow morning. But then, you know how tomorrow morning is. It gets filled up, and, and I was busy doing things. And, 
And in the middle of that morning, a young man had called me the day before and said, I want to stop by and talk. And, and he came by, and this is a young man, he's about 18 years old. We've talked a few times before. He's been through some hard times. Lost his father earlier this year. It's very hard for a young man. And he came in, and we talked, and we had a good time. We talked for about an hour, and we got to the end of it, and he said, I've been wanting to volunteer and do some things, and I said, well, let me, let me write your number down here, uh, and, and I'll ask a couple people, and, uh, and we'll see if we can find something for you to do. And he says, you're going to call me back this time, right? Uh-oh. I said, did I not call you back for, about something? He said, yeah, no. Uh, you remember I was here about a month and a half ago? I said, mm, remind me. He said, you remember I, I had that $200 that I wanted to give to somebody in need? And you said you'd call me back and tell me? And I said, wait, I do remember this. Because when you offered that, I didn't know of anybody in need right at that moment. And I said, but interesting, you should bring that up. You see, this money was from money he had received as a result of his father's passing. But he had felt very strongly that he wanted to give a portion of it to someone in need. And nothing had worked out. He'd come up with some other ideas, but nothing had worked out. You ever heard of anybody who can't get rid of $200? I said, yeah, I know something we can do with that. And uh, he said, well, let's see, I'll have to figure out how to get it to you. And then he got a funny look on his face and he said, no, I don't. I have it right here. He said, I put it in my wallet about a week and a half ago and forgot I had it. So he took it out and handed it to me. And after he left, I picked up the phone and I called the person that had been in my office the day before on a little slip of paper I had literally written, needs about $200. Called her on the phone and I said, hey, I got a story for you. So she came in and I said, let me tell you what just happened. And the thing that thrilled her heart more than anything else was that a month and a half before she even came asking, God had already prepared an 18-year-old young man to be the means by which her need was met. The fruits of sorrow in this young man's life became the sign of God's faithfulness and the seed of hope in someone else's. Faithfulness through simple things is the road to accomplishing mighty works for God. I love this. It's from Patriarchs and uh, Prophets and Kings. It says, God brought Daniel and his associates into connection with the great men of Babylon that in the midst of a nation of idolaters they might represent his character. How did they become fitted for a position of so great trust and honor? It was faithfulness in little things that gave complexion to their whole life. They honored God in the smallest duties as well as in the larger responsibilities. Now I got that book down off my shelf and I took it down and I was reading that section and it suddenly struck me as I was doing that. There's an example of this in the very book I'm reading. I took this picture uh, of the book there. The quote's right there in the middle. You see all those underlined marks in there? It's my book now, but I didn't make those marks. You know who made those marks? My grandfather made those marks. My grandfather who was faithful in the little things. My grandfather was a pastor. My dad was a pastor after him. I'm a pastor after my dad. It was the faithfulness that started in his generation that was passed on through the generations. 
And I was blessed to see that his eyes had fallen on the same page I was reading and his heart had been stirred by the same words. He's the one who used to do teachings from the book of Daniel with these graphics that you see up here. This was PowerPoint back in his day. And if you see zoomed in on there, it's hard to see if you're in the back, but you can see his handwritten notes on these. The faithfulness of my grandfather in the little things. 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. Daniel could have gone wild in the permissive and seductive heathen court of Babylon and no one would have ever known and we would never know his name. But Daniel knew that was not who he was. He was a servant of the Most High God and as such he chose to be faithful. And the result of his faithfulness is blessing that stretches all the way to our day. My young friend could have chosen to spend his $200 any way he wanted, but because he is learning to know who he is, a redeemed son of God through Jesus Christ, he instead gave it as a gift, and as a result, the faith of another was affirmed and her needs were met. What about us? Do we love the Father more than the world and the law of the Lord more than the lust of the land? Do we know who we are? Do we know whose we are? If we don't, we will be overcome by this world of lusts and passions, just like Jared Fogel and Josh Dugar were overcome to their destruction. But if we do know who we are and to whom we belong and for whom we live, if it truly is Jesus in the center of the frame of our lives, then we too can be Daniels in our day, faithfully living for Jesus anywhere that God places us. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Help us to know that we are yours. You have claimed us by the blood of Jesus Christ. And with that knowledge, Lord, help us to have a heart to live for you. That in everything and in every way, we would seek to honor you and would reject anything that would bring you dishonor. That what we say would be what we do And what we claim would be how we would live. We are weak and we fall, yet, Lord, by your grace, cleanse us from our unrighteousness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.